and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. first reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, 
they learned to play her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was an inject jobber, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with a request. Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all outside and then knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She, then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a town. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm, Psalm 23, and we read alternate verses. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. He will make me lie down in green pastures, and lead me beside the silver waters. He will refresh my soul, and guide me in right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, you will grow up and you will start helping me. You spread a table before me in the face of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup shall be full. Surely your goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall go the second reading is a reading from Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white and with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of a great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ, according to God. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all these, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May my words be spoken and heard in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. What does your clothing say about you? Growing up in the church, I remember that we were taught that for the Christian, clothes are relatively unimportant. It's the person who's wearing the clothes, the person inside the clothes that's important. And that verse from, I think it's the first book of Samuel, they would repeat, Man looks on the outside, God looks on the, in, on the heart. Ergo, your clothing is totally separate from who you are as a person. On one level, that's true, of course. Our clothes are separate from us. But imagine someone coming up to you, and you're wearing a new article of clothing. You've just bought it recently and you're very pleased with it. And the person comes up to you and says, good heavens, why did you choose that colour? Does absolutely nothing for you. And the design is simply awful. But please, don't take this personally. I'm just saying it about you, not about your, uh, your clothing, not about you as a person. <coughs> well, of course, how else are you going to take it other than personally? Clothes are an extension of our personality. If somebody, if somebody compliments us on the way we're dressed, we feel that we've received a, a, a compliment that we take personally. We've been complimented personally. <coughs> our clothing is significant and scripture recognises it as such. We saw last week how revelation is rich in images. Today's text from Revelation chapter 7 contains an image of elders before the throne wearing spotless white robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Who are these robes in white? Back in the beginning, we were naked. Naked and ashamed and scared. In order to cover up their nakedness, the Bible says the first couple made clothes from leaves. When God came for his evening stroll in the garden, he couldn't help but burst out laughing when he saw them. He said, you guys have got to be kidding. You look ridiculous. You want clothes? Come here, let me take your measurements. And so God became a tailor and made them clothes from animal skins. The Old Testament scholar Von Rudd says of this passage, God himself had the shame of man covered. He had through his covering of them a new possibility given, and thereby established the basic element of human culture. You see, their protective clothing was a sign of God's grace. God gave it to them. A little later in Genesis, Jacob gives his son Joseph a sign of his favour, a brightly coloured coat. It was not only a sign of his father's favour, it also became an object of his brother's resentment. Clothing is significant. Jesus criticised a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. Purple dye was very expensive, so purple clothes became a mark of wealth. 
It's the colour of royalty. By contrast, the poor beggars, be beggar Lazarus, who lay outside the rich man's gate, was covered in sores. The first letter of Peter exhorts women not to rely on outward adornment or beauty, but to cultivate the inner life. And some have taken this to be a prohibition of all cosmetics, jewellery, hairdressers, and so on. Back in the 1950s, the Baptist World Alliance met in Berlin for their Congress, and the German Baptist women were appalled, absolutely appalled, to see the Southern Baptist women from the United States wearing lipstick and mascara and rouge and diamond rings and necklaces and bracelets and coiffed hair. They were scandalised that our Christian sisters from America could be so worldly. And they wept for them. Huge tears of remorse. And as they wept, their tears fell into huge steins of beer. You understand what I'm saying? And then the American women were appalled that their German sisters were so worldly as to drink beer. Well, what does clothing mean for us and for God? That's an example of different cultures. Psalm 104 says that God is clothed in light. In Exodus chapter 28, Aaron, the first high priest, is commanded to be dressed in sacred vestments to give him honour and dignity. There's a saying, clothes make the man. That's obviously true. In this case, the vestments gave the priest honour and holiness. Psalm 132 talks about the clothing of priests. Verse 9 says God's priests are to be clothed with righteousness. So it's not only outward decoration, it has to be matched by the inner righteousness of the heart. In Isaiah chapter 61, the prophet talks about God clothing him with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garment. Clothing is again here, as in Genesis, an expression of grace. The clothing makes something out of, uh, out of, uh, makes something out of me that I wouldn't be without the special clothes. And so we wear vestments in the church. You put on a different kind of robe and a person is a judge. Or another kind, they're a professor. Or another kind, and they're a Lord Mayor. To give someone clothing is to give yourself, part of yourself, to them. To confer something upon another person. So Jacob gave Joseph a special coat. When Jonathan and David in the Old Testament formed a close friendship. The first book of Samuel, chapter 18, says, The soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David. Their love for each other was so strong that they made a covenant with one another. And Jonathan took off his robe and his tunic and his sword, his bow and his belt, and gave them to David. He was saying, I am giving you myself. Before the prophet Elijah was about to depart this earth, he gave his mantle to Elisha. Elisha took off his own clothes and put on this mantle, this cloak. It was a way of authority being transferred from Elijah to Elisha. With the clothes came the power. The biblical writer speaks of the clothing of Jesus having power. When an infirm woman merely touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. Later, in the book of Acts, the sick people who touched the apostles' garments were healed. When the prodigal son returns home, his father gives him the best clothing as a sign of acceptance and sonship, a robe, a ring, shoes on his feet, signs of his father's favour and acceptance. Our clothes show forth our identity, our personality, our deepest commitments. Have you ever gone to a social event wearing the wrong clothes? It can be very embarrassing. Twenty years after my, I, I left high school, um, we had a, uh, a 20th year high school reunion. 
and uh, the invitation said dress, smart, casual. Now that can mean anything to anyone, but I wore a pair of neat slacks, trousers, checked shirt uh, with a collar, long sleeves and so on. As soon as I arrived, I felt quite underdressed. The women looked fabulous and the guys were mainly wearing suits and ties. And I thought to myself, these are the same guys who would do anything in school to get out of wearing a tie, but here they're wearing them voluntarily. There's a parable in the Gospels of the King's banquet. One of the guests is thrown out because he's not wearing the proper clothes. Now, I hope that this quick, quick romp through some of what the Bible has to say about clothes and clothing shows you that it's not something practical to keep us warm or modest, and therefore has only utilitarian value. Clothing is important. It has significance. Clothing says a lot about the person wearing it. You put different clothes on a person, and in a sense the person changes. Clothes extend a person's existence. Clothing for us not only expresses who we are, it also forms who we are. I don't go walking in the bush wearing a dinner suit. I don't go swimming in the beach wearing gardening clothes. The doctor wears white. The judge wears black. He wears a funny looking wig. So, why is that? The judge is there, not sitting as an individual. He's not making a, ju a judgment on the basis of his or her personal preference, but on the demands of the law. The judge is functioning as an officer of the legal system, a member of something larger than his own personality. So it's appropriate that the judge's individuality be covered by special clothing. The bride is normally clothed in white. The bridegroom wears probably formal attire or something else. As a child, I remember seeing elderly Italian ladies dressed in black. It was a sign that they were widows. Of course, the significance of clothing may change over time. Blue denim jeans were originally designed for the rough and tumble of life on a farm. In other words, they were made for hard work. Later, they became the sign of youthful rebellion and non-conformity. Now, they signal, signal anonymity and sameness and conformity. When a soldier puts on a uniform, there is a radical change. The soldier has a duty to perform, an assignment to carry out. St Paul says in the letter to the Galatians that as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Elsewhere, he urges us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the book of Romans. In the early church, those who were baptised were dressed in new white robes, demonstrating their new status. It could be said that the essential characteristic of the Christian is one who changes clothes. In being reclothed, there's a new consciousness Clothes really do make people. We are those who put off the old garments of sin and are called to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But just because a person is clothed in a particular way, does it really change them? Swiss reformer Huldreich Zwingli noticed that when a novice joined a monastery in the Middle Ages, he was given a monk's habit and cowl. They were all of one side. So a young man, maybe barely out of school, wearing the large habit of an adult monk would look rather ridiculous. Yet over time, the young monk would grow into the garment. One day, it would fit him. Zwingli said, in similar fashion, when we're baptised, we are clothed with a big name, the name of Christ, Christian. Christian, Christ's one. It may seem ridiculous, ridiculous putting such a large name on someone. And yet, given time, by the grace of God, we shall grow into that new name. One day it will fit us perfectly and will be as we profess. Clothing signifies a change. A change from the way we act at work 
to the way we act at a party, to the way we act at leisure time. You think of the special clothing worn by basketball players or soccer, soccer goal people, uh, keepers, football umpires, referees and so on. It's all part of the ritual. It enables us to enter into the game with special commitment. Genesis says we're naked, frail creatures, spiritually as well as, uh, as, well as physically naked. The robes we're called upon to fill are too big for us. We're asked to act and decide and function in ways that can frighten us. I remember a doctor saying one reason he wore the uniform, the mask, the rubber gloves, was not only for hygiene, but also for encouragement. He said, if you are going into surgery to cut on another human being's body, you need to be a doctor, even when you don't feel like it. When I put on all this stuff, I'm a doctor, no matter how I feel about it. The second letter to the Corinthians speaks of the hope that in eternity we won't be unclothed, but overclothed. This could relate back to our nakedness in Genesis. Our mortality shall now put on immortality. We who are naked, frail and vulnerable shall put on immortality. Clothing that we can't put on by ourselves. It's a gift of God. Today's scripture from Revelation speaks of the hope that we will be given new clothing washed in the blood of the Lamb. Our dirty clothes, soiled by all the wrong that we've done and have done to us, will be put away and we shall be clean. We don't have to be anxious about whether we are wearing the proper attire. God will clothe us. The same God who made clothes for our ancestors to cover their nakedness shall wash our clothes as white as snow. Our clothing will not be made by us, but by the gracious tailoring of the Lamb. So we can go from here today, clothed in power from on high, clothed in God's grace, washed clean, clothed for protection against the pain and difficulties of life, clothed so that we are more than who we are at present, being adorned, made ready to live with God for all eternity. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was the incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he came to the human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church.
good shepherd of your sheep. Your flock is from every tribe and nation. Hear our prayers for the peoples of the world. We pray for leaders of nations and all who govern. For all people suffering from famine, war, disease. Bring new life to all who live in short, short circumstances. Loving God, in your mercy. Good shepherd of your sheep and saviour of your flock. You search out the lost and rejoice to bring them home. Hear our prayers for your church, its clergy and people. We pray for prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. For all whose lives are the witness to your gospel. Open our ears to hear your voice and let us know where you lead. Loving God, in your mercy, Good Shepherd of the sheep, you know your flock and call us each by name. Hear our prayers for the community in which we live. We pray for all whom we love and those with whom we share our daily life. For the homeless, the hungry and the unwanted. Send us to be shepherds to your lost and lonely ones. Loving God, in your mercy, Good shepherd of your sheep, you go with your flock on the darkest and most dangerous path. Hear our prayers for all in need. We pray for those in places of grief, despair and loneliness. For those sick or in pain, the confused and infirm. Help us to tend the wounds of those who suffer. Loving God, in your mercy, Good Shepherd, Lamb of God, your flock the waters of eternal life when none shall perish. Hear our prayers for those who have found their rest with you. We remember those of this parish who have gone before us. May we so follow you in life that in death we may come with the saints of every nation and tribe to the place of everlasting gladness you prepare for us. Loving God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what you have asked in your name, we may by your grace receive, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ is risen, alleluia, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia, alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
offer, which earth has given and human hands have made, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use these offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Oh, glory and honor be yours. Rejoicing in God. 
God's new creation, let us pray as our Redeemer has taught us.
most glorious Lord of life, we thank you that you nourish us in these Easter mysteries. Fill us with the spirit of love and unite us in faith that we may witness to the resurrection and show your glory to all the world. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go faithfully and with courage in the power of your spirit.